Lewis Johnson, United States Navy, World War II, Omaha Beach, D-Day. Lou was on board LST-157 as they crossed the English Channel the morning of June 6, 1944. And Lewis took troops of the 29th Infantry Division to Omaha Beach that day. He's with the United States Navy. He's my adopted father. I love this man. We've done many things together. Uh, we've been to France. We've been to Omaha Beach. We've been to Iwo Jima. And we've done a lot of school presentations over the year. And he's just a great, great man. I love this man. I hope you will too. Um, I w his neighbor back in Lakewood, Colorado in 2003, his neighbor heard me on Rick Crandall's uh, radio show. Rick is a big World War II advocate. And so the neighbor comes over to Lewis's house, Lou and Ruthie Johnson in Lakewood, and tells him about me. And then Lewis calls me and I'm over there. May 19, 2003 is when this interview was done. And uh, it's one of my favorite stories. I hope you enjoy this. God bless you as you watch these videos. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Shall I have my makeup uh, first? <laughs> no, I don't, think you, I don't think you need any. I think you look uh, First thing I want you to do is just identif identify for me the unit you're with. I, in the Army, they call me units, but you were on an LST. Just tell Before me. Before you start, you though, <clears throat> you were aware that uh, D Day was supposed to be the fifth? Okay. See, some people don't even know that. Um, Definitely aware of that. Because we were all loaded. I know, you're ready to go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was it. Eisenhower was ready to go on the 5th. And, uh, yeah. Can you imagine the pressure on that man to make that decision? I met him, yeah, before D-Day in London. Mm -hmm. um, he, he came in on the train with, of course, he had a lot of people around him, <clears throat> a lot of brass, but they uh, they grabbed a. I was on Liberty, <clears throat> and they grabbed a bunch of us guys, uh, soldiers and sailors, to uh, throw a cordon, a cordon around him, to keep the people back. Looked just like the pictures you see, smiling. <clears throat> this kind of take me back a little bit. Just. Um in your mind, you've already said some things I'm pro hoping you're going to say again about the chaos on the beach and just, um, you know, you guys are a bunch of kids and stuff, but just, can you go back to just before the landing? I mean, if you want to make that, the, what, what I'm interested in is like, mid, let's, let's go back to midnight. If you can remember around midnight on June 6th, it's D-Day. You may, you, if you want to say something about it, it was originally on the 5th, go ahead, but, but lead me into that night. It's midnight, it's early in the morning and preparations that you made or your your involvement with the actual uh, wave or whatever part you had to going into the beach. So just, just back up and give me what you got. Well, I would like to begin on um, the 5th. The, um, we were fully loaded with the 29th Infantry and um, they're accompanying tanks, Sherman tanks. <clears throat> we had a um, a chaplain to come aboard, and uh, everyone was scared. And <clears throat> we were on the tank deck, and uh, I couldn't see the chaplain because of the crowd. And I climbed up on the turret of a Sherman tank so that I could see him. And he gave us a little pep talk, uh, nothing really religious, but just. Uh, a pep talk, and um, we were supposed to weigh anchor, but the weather was so bad that we had to lay to. But uh, <clears throat> oh, about two o'clock in the morning, I guess, or earlier, maybe midnight, on uh, which would be June the sixth, 
we finally weighed anchor and it, the weather was miserable. High wind, high waves, cold, rain, low clouds. <clears throat> but the memory I have then was <clears throat> uh, the droning of the aeroplanes. Uh, they, they say that there were thousands in the air, and I, I believe it. Uh, of course, it was still night, and we couldn't see them until the next day. But um, I felt so sorry for the, the, the troops, the soldiers. Us sailors, uh, we, were, we had our sea legs, as we call it, and uh, it didn't bother us. But these guys were so sick. Um, and wet and cold. Um, there wasn't too much bantering back and forth. Uh, men were sort of um, pulled within themselves thinking about what could happen. And it's a strange thing. Every guy says, well, it won't happen to me. You may get it, but I'm going to and it's a good attitude to have. It's survival. And uh, I suppose I was more frightened because <clears throat> of our past experiences. And they referred to this as going into harm's way. And I felt that after North Africa, after Sicily, after Salerno, Italy, and man, this is going to be it, and, and am I going to make it? And uh, I kept thinking, uh, well, I will make it. <clears throat> so um, that carried us uh, through the night. Uh, and we were carrying, <clears throat> we were towing what was known as a rhino ferry. And uh, this was a long, like a barge with uh, extremely extreme heavy uh, outboard engines on on the stern, and um, we knew, or, or the brass knew, what the beaches were going to be like, with all of the preparation that the Germans had been making over the years, the tank traps and the boat traps, and how are we going to get in with these ships? Because an LST is 326 feet long, and even though it's a flat bottom boat, it's still, it's big. And the idea that this rhino ferry would come around to our bow, we would open the doors, lower the ramp, and it would come right up on the ramp, and the tanks would come off of the LST onto the rhino, because they only drew about three feet, and they could get in pretty close. So <clears throat> that's why uh, I, I can't tell you what wave we were in because there was so much, there were mass confusion. The, the uh, smaller boats that were going in, the LCVPs, the LCTs, the uh, LCIs, <clears throat> so many of them were, were uh, uh, getting impaled upon these steel uh, uh, traps. Uh, the traps were mined. And when they would hit the trap, naturally it would blow up. <clears throat> we dispatched six LCVPs, and each LCVP uh, had about 36 men aboard, uh, infantrymen. Uh, all six came back. One was, uh, was riddled. And when we uh, dropped the davits to, to raise it back aboard, <laughs> it was leaking like a sieve. And uh, there, were <clears throat> um, there were 10 wounded and three killed uh, out of, of the 36 that, that was dispatched from this particular boat. The other LCVPs, um, the other five, um, we asked the coxswain about them later, and they said, well, it was just massacre. These guys were uh, going into the water. Uh, 
they were drowning. Um, they had a, a life belt that was a rubberized life belt that you would squeeze and you have little pneumatic tubes that would inflate them. Well, these guys were getting hit, these soldiers, and they were bobbing like corks. Their heads were down, their feet were down, and uh, this life belt was just... Um, and that was pretty nerve-wracking. Uh, it's demoralizing. And they were trying to fish these poor guys out of the water as fast as they could. Um, <clears throat> Anyhow, um, I remember one thing, um, there was so much, uh, in an invasion, uh, they have it planned so certain things happen in, in sequence. Uh, the, uh, the shark troops, the ones that go in first, they're, they're pretty lightly equipped. They have their rifle, the bayonet, uh, and their ammo, and, and uh, a couple of uh, jugs of water, canteens. Uh, then they depend upon the, uh, the supply boats coming in to bring in uh, mortars and uh, more ammo and, of course, more men. <clears throat> But so many of the, uh, the boats were getting knocked out that uh, they were running out of ammunition. And I, I recall that uh, there were a couple of boats that uh, came out to us. We were about maybe a thousand yards off the beach. But anyway, they were coming out and begging for 30 and 50 caliber ammunition. So, uh, and we had that kind of ammo aboard ship. We had 20 millimeter, 40 millimeter, 30 caliber, 50 caliber. Um, and we unloaded all of the uh, small arms or small ammo that, that we had to supply the guys on the beach. Tell me now, you were carrying the 29th Infantry? 29th Infantry. Um, and they came from England on the LST with you? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, we. Um, uh, our port was uh, Falmouth, which is down in Cornwall. Where's that relative to Weymouth, right <laughs> there? Like yes, the south of uh, Weymouth, mm -hmm. on, on the English uh, Channel coast. Okay. Now, you said a lot of the soldiers were sick. Where were you when you were going over with that wave of soldiers? And were you interacting with them, or were you just seeing them from a distance? Or tell me a little bit. No, we, we interacted uh, with them. Sometimes I felt more like a, <clears throat> a, an army guy than I did a Navy because we, uh, in, in my couple of years in that European theater, uh, we carried thousands of, of guys. And um, it was always interesting to talk to them because we're Navy, they're Army, and they're interested in us, and we're interested in them. And of course, we always tried to feed them. It's, it's, it's like uh, the condemned man ate a hearty meal. It's not really funny, but you make a lot of jokes ab about uh, things like that in, in combat. It kind of eases the, the pressure at times. But um, going into, uh, into Normandy, to Omaha, um, we, um, they were aboard ship longer than they were supposed to have been because D-Day was supposed to have been the fifth. But uh, they came on around the fourth and we were on the fifth and then on the sixth. So food was getting a little, a little scarce when you had that many men aboard. Um, my position was right up on the bow. Uh, I was uh, in combat, I was a 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gunner. And um, so once we got near the beach, naturally uh, the troops, the army troops, were mustered <clears throat> to get ready to uh, leave. 
And so from there on, it was uh, um, our, our duty as gunners to keep searching the skies and doing whatever. And fortunately, uh, we were not bothered by the Luftwaffe. They had been knocked out by the uh, Air Force. And um, I can't say enough good things about uh, the Air Force. They, they really took care of it because uh, before down in the, Med, in the Mediterranean, <clears throat> um, we were outnumbered by the Germans, the Air Force. And um, we really expected that in, in uh, the invasion of Normandy. But fortunately, we didn't have that. Now tell me, how close does the LST get to shore, and then or the Higgins boats let out, and then they go to shore? Or did your LST didn't go to shore? We uh, went ashore um, in the late afternoon of uh, the sixth. We they finally uh, between the Army engineers and the and the Navy demo boys, uh, UDTs and guys like that. Uh, they finally cleared enough of the obstacles that we could get these LSTs in. Um, so in the afternoon, uh, we, we hit the beach. And uh, we were on the beach all day the 6th and the, uh, the 7th. And I believe it was the 8th that we pulled off and went back to England and loaded up immediately. And while we were loading, we took on stores. When I say stores, that means food. And, and, um, and then took off again. And um, all told, uh, we made uh, 26 landings after D-Day. And uh, we hit um, Utah, um, well, I have um, a, a list here of all the beaches, the places that we hit. We hit every one of them, even the British. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we took uh, British reinforcements. We took American reinforcements. We even had one load of, of Red Cross units. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the ladies uh, that passed out cigarettes and coffee and donuts. Of course, that was later in the in the war but uh well, tell me now on, on june 6th now i'm still trying to figure this okay you were coming across you didn't go to shore you let off the lcbps yes the, the davits lower they were lowered were you involved did you see that tell me a little bit about that the boats maybe the men getting off into the boats off the cargo nets or what have you and then going to shore just tell me what you remember by the end of that well i was uh like I say, all that time I was uh, up on the bow, uh, the, the skipper used me as the eyes of the ship because he couldn't see anything down uh, below. So <clears throat> I had my, my earphones on and my mic and um, I could uh, tell him what was going on. But um, yeah, the, uh, we lowered the, uh, the LCVPs and uh, we had the, uh, the nets, the cargo nets so over the side. And uh, that's an interesting thing, uh, uh, watching those guys go over. Uh, it's almost acrobatic because the ship is up and down and then uh, being heavier, it is a, of a lesser motion than the LCVPs. And when they drop the cargo nets, they drop them so that they they land inside the LCVP, and then these guys scrambling down, and you can imagine they're trying to judge when that, uh, either when the boat comes comes up the LCVP that they step off onto it, or when it goes all the way down they scurry down. Um, some don't make it, some fall, and um, uh, but uh, anyway. What they, um, when the, the, the uh, six boats, and this is typical of all the LSTs, 
when the six VPs, as we call them, are, are fully loaded, they, uh, they, they take off and they will circle. They get into a, a, a little group here and you see these pods of LCVPs circling and they're waiting for a beach master. Uh, this is uh, usually a, a Navy man who is uh, in liaison with the Army and the Army is telling them, telling him what they need. And so he is um, uh, by either by uh, radio or by signal flags uh, telling uh, what they want. Well, anyway, uh, they're, the casualties were so great that uh, they needed men in the, in the worst way. And just about as quickly as these boats were loaded, they were in, going in. And um, we estimated that in the 29th, uh, that is the 29th Army, that we probably lost better than 50%. I've seen coxswains coming back crying. They were and, and scared, and we were all scared. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not ashamed to admit it. No. The um, let me let me inject something right there. Yeah. What, were you aware at all? Of two things of what was happening on the beach with those first waves obviously you were and secondly what were your thoughts about the men going into the uh, with the LCBPs to the shore were you praying for them were you thinking oh my god what do they get do they know what they're getting into I mean what, what, what were your thoughts Larry it, it's 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 kind of difficult to really remember after all these years <clears throat> we knew what we were getting into because we've we've gone through this before. Now some of the uh, the troops, um, th this was their first time in into combat, and they didn't have the slightest idea of what it was going to be like, and that was a lot of our conversation uh, before we weighed anchor. Uh, they were curious as, you know, hey, Mac, <laughs> everybody is Mac in the, in the military or in the Navy, but what's it like? Uh, what, do, what do we expect? What can we expect? And well, what do you tell them? You, you know, you can't say, well, you're going to get your head blown off. You, 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 you try to make light of it as, as little as you can. And uh, one of the things I used to say to them, I said, look, I've gone through North Africa, I've gone through Sicily, I've gone through Salerno, Italy, and look at me, I'm still here. Well, that's kind of reassuring that, uh, geez, everybody don't get killed. And, uh, but my thoughts were, even though, you know, a thousand yards is, is uh, that's 10 football fields, you know. And uh, it's pretty difficult. You, 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 you can see a lot of activity uh, and, and uh, you see boats hitting and not coming off, you know, and uh, uh, getting blown up. Uh, because those beaches were zeroed in. Uh, Crossfire, we, we call it. That, uh, and you can imagine that there were hundreds of thousands of, of bullets uh, from the, uh, the German machine guns and they're from their rifles, the automatic weapons, plus uh, mortars uh, and, and the heavy artillery. Um, in fact, where we finally uh, pulled up on the beach, there was a pillbox there that, uh, of course, it was knocked out, but the 88 was still there, 88 millimeter, which was a fantastic gun. And 
years later, when I went back, I found that spot and that gun's still there. Rested, but still there. But I'll tell you, my heart just, just bled for, for what was going on. We didn't know, we as, as the sailors, we didn't know the, the, the fullest extent of the brutality, the, of the casualties and, until later. We knew it was bad because of, of all the messages that were being sent back and forth. Uh, we need troops. And of course, the, the big troop ships sitting out, then they were further out than we were. And uh, where our VPs only had to go a thousand yards, some of these uh, guys from the troop ships, they must have been going half a mile or more. And they were so sick when they hit the beach uh, that some of them had lost their weapons because they were wading ashore. Um, Sad, just real sad. And this is um, where <clears throat> mom and dad, they knew where I, that I was in England. And uh, they knew from my uh, past experiences in the Mediterranean that I was probably there. But uh, in about a week, <clears throat> It's when they got the, a telegram that I was killed on D-Day. And uh, it was devastating because I was an only child. I guess even, you know, if there had been more brothers and, or sisters, it, it's still when you lose a, a son. But um, my, uh, my name is spelled L-E-W-I-S, my first name. And usually <clears throat> the first name is L-O-U-I-S. L-E-W-I-S is a surname. But uh, <clears throat> there was another, this guy was a soldier, army, from St. Louis, which was my hometown, spelled the same way. And uh, it's understandable how things like that can happen, a, a mix-up in communication. But years later, when I went back, I found... <clears throat> <clears throat> I found this, the, the cross, and, and Larry, I'll tell you when, you, when you look down and you see, <laughs> you see your name, it, uh, and uh, I cried all day. Uh, I, I, I couldn't help myself. I found within reason, in fact, in back of you, there's a, a bottle that's got uh, Omaha sand in it. See it? Anyway, I, uh, I found the spot where we landed and uh, I kneeled and said a prayer. The, uh, there, there's um, like a road that they, the, the 29th went up and there's a monument there uh, in memory of those who were killed. And, I, and I've forgotten how many of the 29th, but it, it, was, a, it was a slaughter. Do you remember, not that it's totally relevant, do you remember which beach sector you were on? No. Okay. Because when you went back, I don't know that they have markers like this no, is they, easy they, red, this is dog green, this is dog red. Uh, at the time I went back, uh, they, they didn't. And, and <clears throat> um, so I, I don't know. Um, That's okay. I mean, some of the guys do, some don't, but... I guess one reason I asked that question is because when I go back, I've um, actually got a French family from one of the other veterans. We've kind of communicated through email. They're going to show me where Easy Red was. They said Easy Red was one of the worst sectors. And then the movie Saving Private Ryan, I don't know if you saw that. Oh, yes. Um, that was supposedly a dog green. So, But I know a lot of the, the landings didn't happen. A lot of the guys didn't land where they're supposed to because oh, no. of the waves. 
they were all knocked mm -hmm. one or two kilometers off course. So the proposed landing was on paper, but the actual landings were off course, and that contributed to the chaos on the beach. That's right. Um, when you're maneuvering, practicing these landings, uh, of course, there's nobody shooting at you, and even in those rehearsals, it's chaotic at times because we try to simulate as, 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 as much as possible reality. And in fact, <laughs> they used to pick stormy days for us to land because anybody can land on the beach when it's nice and smooth. But boy, when you're tossing around, it's a different uh, situation. So you know where you're supposed to go. And then when you land and you're not where you're supposed to be, uh, it's mass confusion then. And officers were being knocked out, uh, uh, and non-coms were being killed or wounded, and uh, a lot of the you know, guys were on their own. And, and believe me, when you're, when you're seasick and when you're scared out of your mind, and you see nothing but, but bodies, and you're thinking, am I going to be next? You know, uh, I'm thinking like these soldiers must have thought. Uh, quite frankly, uh, I, I was far enough away from uh, you know, the actual, say, machine gunning, but still I, can, I could visualize what these guys were going through. And what we were getting was um, air bursts. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, the, uh, they have proximity fuses. I guess that's what this called. They can set a, a shell so that it explodes in, in midair. It's, it's, it's called an air burst. And of course, shrapnel comes down. <clears throat> and <laughs> I know uh, more than once uh, I tried to dig a hole in the steel deck. <laughs> we used to say, try to dig a, a foxhole in, in the steel deck. And because uh, we had our, our, our battle helmets like the Army did, uh, same type of helmet. And boy, we would pull our head down. <laughs> and uh, uh, we were issued in the beginning uh, a KPOC life jacket. It's a big, heavy jacket and then we were issued the the belts with the pneumatic tubes but uh, we wore those k-box uh, jackets uh, like a flak vest and uh, any kind of uh, protection you can get I'm gonna ask you a question I'm looking at my tape here okay we got a few minutes I'm asking all the veterans this question so I want you to think before you answer this and this will be my last question for you about this unless I think of something else but um, looking back now, in light of what you went through, and in, in today's generation and the kids today, if you had a message to the younger generation today, what do you think you would say to them in light of what you went through, World War II, the sacrifices that were made, and the freedoms and the liberties that we have today? What, what kind of message would you, would you share with the young kids today as a veteran? Well, <clears throat> a lot of people don't agree with me. But I can say this, Larry, I went in at 19 and uh, I came out three years later, three years, three months, and three days, uh, a different person. I went in as a kid, I came out as a man. And I think in today's society that if we had mandatory service. These kids come out of high school and they serve two years. That's not too much out of their life. I think they would come out with a better perspective on life. Um, I know I did. When I came out, um, I wanted to go to school. I wanted to improve myself. And I did. And um, I've, I feel that <clears throat> I had been a very successful person. I'm married 57 years now to the same lady. 
uh, four wonderful uh, children, two boys, two girls, who are all married, uh, and, and 12 grandchildren, and a couple great-grandchildren. So I think my life has been uh, reasonably successful financially. Um, I have a nice home. Um, I'm retired. I don't have to worry about money. Um, a couple good cars. Um, and I think a lot of it was due to my military. I agree. I'm going to stop the camera, okay? Okay. Okay, now kind of just, if you can just kind of point, can you look, you can kind of look at it sideways or something, just kind of point maybe, yeah, there you go, yeah, or put it on your, your, your knee, there you go, um, tilt it down just a little bit, Lou, there you go. I like, yeah, keep the glare out of there, okay, go ahead and just kind of tell me what you got going there. Well, this is the uh, European Theater, mm -hmm. which um, is uh, the African, the Sicilian, the, uh, the Italian campaigns. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, the Normandy uh, campaign, and there are four battle stars there for my two years uh, in service over there. And then <clears throat> there's the. Um, okay, tilt it down a little bit, Lou. There you go. There you go. That's the amphibious patch. Mm -hmm. um, a picture of me after I came back from overseas. Um, then there's the Pacific, uh, the uh, I believe it's called the Asian uh, Medal, and good conduct. Believe it or not, <laughs> I was a good boy. <laughs> I was a good sailor. Um, my uh, <clears throat> uh, my uh, final grade, all my schools and everything was 3.98. So uh, I worked hard, yeah. and um, then. Oh, there's the uh, 50th anniversary uh, medal, mm -hmm. the victory medal. Um, but like I say, uh, nothing heroic. Right. Uh, give me one last thing. I, I got to get this on tape. I need give me the name of this, the LST you were with, and then you were a second machine. Uh, the okay, give me your full title, the, okay. the the group you're with, and the LST. All right. Normandy. That was LST one five seven. And uh, my rate, rating, my rate of, at the time I was discharged was motor machinist mate second class. That was T157, okay. Yeah. okay.